All right. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Zechariah chapter 9? We're making our way through the book. We've got six more chapters to go in five sermons. So we'll see where we go. As you're turning, I want you to consider authority structures that are in the world. Governmental structures, educational structures, employment structures, structures of law enforcement. Sometimes those structures act in such a way that suggests that they actually possess more autonomy and more authority than they really do. Governments make laws that contravene God's design for human flourishing. And education forsakes its primary task sometimes in favor of a more liberal agenda. And employers introduce initiatives that have nothing to do with their sector and products and services And uh, all of these things take place. And so we want to ask ourselves, how should we think about that, especially when it hits pretty close to home, in our jobs, in our education, for ourselves and our kids and everything else? Today, what we're going to see is that God actually controls all of these things. He has control over human history, and he has control over human history in three ways in our passage today. We're going to see that he has control over human history through a pagan instrument, and that he has control over human history through a perfect Emmanuel, and control over human history through a present inclusion of his people. Now, we've been looking at Zechariah for quite a while now, and again, the book is basically broken up into three sections. At the beginning, you have these series of eight visions, and we covered that over the course of a few weeks. And then last time we were together, we talked about these four messages that God had for his people of Israel. The remainder of the book covers two different oracles. And these oracles are in chapters 9 through 11, the first one, and the second one is in chapters 12 through 14. And in general, this first oracle focuses on the time between when the Jews returned from exile to the earthly ministry of Christ. And the second oracle generally focuses on the events that surround the establishment of the millennial kingdom and Christ ruling and reigning over that millennial kingdom. And you're going to see the word oracle at the beginning of chapter 9, and you're going to see it again at the beginning of chapter 12. So it's important for us to understand what an oracle is And an oracle is a burdensome message. And what it really entails is a prophecy of judgment against people. And and today in the first part of the first oracle, we are going to see a prophecy of judgment against the Gentiles. And it's important for us to understand that this was probably written 40 to 50 years after Zechariah gave the visions. So he's a much older man. And some of this might seem repetitive to us, but it's important for us to know that Zechariah is talking to the next generation of Jews. And this generation needs the same encouragements and the same promises as the generation that came before them. And so today's passage is going to involve prophecy mostly near term to the time of Zechariah. Um, And it's going to be mostly in the intertestamental period, but it's also going to touch on the earthly ministry of Christ. But what we're going to do is we're going to look not only at what those prophecies are, but we're going to look at how those prophecies are fulfilled. And the reason why is because that gives us confidence that for those promises that have been made that have yet been unfulfilled, we can have confidence that God will actually fulfill those and they will come to pass. So in all of this, we want to remember that God is completely in control, so much so that first he uses a pagan instrument to accomplish that task. And we're going to see that in verses one through eight of chapter nine. And so to this point, God has made many, many promises, and he has said that he will be faithful And near, not only does he guarantee the outcome of those promises, but he actually tells us exactly how it is that those things are going to come to pass. Not only what will happen, but how it will happen. We're going to see the same thing in Zechariah that we saw in Daniel in our evening service series a couple of years ago. What we're going to see is that world powers and military leaders, they are nothing more than instruments in God's hand as he shapes and forms human history. In fact, in Proverbs 21.1, we read this. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of Yahweh. He turns it wherever he pleases. So the king is an instrument in God's hand. And that's what we want to keep in front of us. And here in this chapter, the main instrument in God's hand is none other than Alexander the Great. He was one of the most remarkable military leaders in the course of human history. But again, he was only an instrument in God's hands. 
He was born in 356 BC. These prophecies were made sometime around 480 BC, so it was something around 125, 130 years or so after the time that Zechariah was speaking these oracles. So he was born in 356. In 338, he began his military conquest at the age of 18 years old. He was 18 when he started these conquests in present-day Turkey. He moved his way west to Syria, then he moved across to the area of Tyre and Sidon, which is Tyre and Sidon, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean coast. Then he moved down to Egypt. Then he doubled back and moved through the Promised Land on his way east to India and Pakistan. And by 325, he had conquered most of the known world by the age of 31, and he died from an illness two years later. But again, he is an instrument in God's hand to secure exactly what it is that God intended to do. And what God intended to do was to bring a judgment to the Gentiles. So what we're going to see here is how God accomplishes that judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 1, the oracle of the word of Yahweh is against the hand of Hadrach, with Damascus as its resting place. For the eyes of men, especially all the tribes of Israel, are toward Yahweh. So you see the the mention of Hadrach. That is the Syrians. That's the land of Syria, the nation of Syria, which is to the north and to the east of the promised land. And Damascus was their capital. And God's burdensome message and his prophecy of judgment is against them. It's against Syria. And it has a resting place there. And what that tells us is that God's judgment will be heavy and it will be immovable upon Damascus. And all of the people, especially the Jews, are going to be watching to see exactly what it is that God does. Israel will be looking on as God carries out his judgment. And in verse 2, we read that Hamath also, which borders on it, on Israel, that's a nation, uh, that's the, the nation of Syria, and Hamath is a city within that nation. They're going to be receiving God's judgment. So that's the prophecy. That's what God says. They have a burden and the prophecy and the judgment is coming to them. And again, it was about 480 BC when that came. We want to advance 140 years or so, somewhere like that. Alexander the Great conquered Syria in 330 BC, 333 BC. He defeated Darius III at the Battle of Isis when he was 23 years old. So God decreed this in 480, and it came to pass somewhere around 150 years later. So God's judgment came to pass. And we're going to start to see a pattern here that that God decrees a judgment, and then we're going to see how it is that it actually comes to pass. And that's our first example. That's the beginning of the case that we're going to be building here. Next, he moves on to Tyre and Sidon. You see that uh, further on in verse 2. So the oracle is also against Tyre and Sidon. And these are two regions, two areas, two cities that were known for for really two things. On one hand, they were known for their engineering accomplishments and their engineering and their technical expertise. And on the other hand, they were known for their wealth and their commerce. 600 years earlier, Solomon had interactions with the king of Tyre, King Hiram. He was gathering the the materials for the construction of the, the temple, Solomon's temple, the vast, magnificent, beautiful temple. And he needed the materials, and he knew that the best trees and the best wood were in uh, the area of Tyre and Sidon. But he also knew that all the skill was there to deal with them. I'm going to read uh, for you from 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 6. Solomon is writing to King Hiram of Tyre, and he's writing about the workmen that are in that place. He said to King Hiram, So now, command that your servants cut for me cedars from Lebanon, for you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. Even Solomon, with all of his wisdom, all of his knowledge, and all of his expertise, he knew that uh, these people had skill and expertise that, that no one else had. But this skill and this expertise is what made them proud. We see that as we read further in verse 2. They are very, very wise, but they're wise And they believed that all of their engineering skill and expertise is what made them untouchable. They felt that they were beyond the reach of anybody else because of their engineering genius and their skill. But God has a message for them, and his message was that your wisdom will not stand against my judgment. 
And in this way, Tyre plays right into God's hand. And we see that in verse 3. So Tyre built for herself a tight fortification. And in Hebrew, the word Tyre means fortress. Very similar to the word for fortress. And that's what the city was. It was on an island, and it was about a half a mile off of the coast. They built their city there, and they built walls around it. And it was very, very safe, and it was impregnable. Previous conquerors had tried to come and take it, and every one of them had failed. So they were very, very confident in what they had done to build a fortress for themselves. They were confident in their own wisdom, but they were also confident in their wealth. And look at the rest of this. As you read on in verse 3, they tied up silver like dust and fine gold like mire in the streets. They were so wealthy through their commerce that silver and gold were everywhere and of relatively little value. So here they are, there's this this nation that that thinks they're impregnable, they're loaded, they're wealthy, everything's going well for them. But you see the judgment, and that's where it comes in verse 4. God says, Behold, the Lord will dispossess her and strike her wealth down into the sea, and she will be consumed with fire. And that's exactly what Alexander did. In 332 BC, for seven months, he laid siege to the city of Tyre, which was, again, out in the ocean. And the way that he did this was he built a causeway out to the island from the mainland. And it was 20 feet high, and it was 200 feet wide, and it was half a mile long. And when he was finished building that causeway, he marched his army out across that causeway, and they took the city. I think we've got a picture of it up there. You can see it. And they destroyed the city, and they burned the city, and they threw all of their possessions into the sea, exactly as God decreed it. But the focus here is not on Alexander and all of his accomplishments. What we need to focus on is here is that the sovereign God chooses to use a pagan instrument to accomplish his purposes. That's exactly what is happening. And God is decreeing these events, and then he is using that pagan instrument to bring it to pass. And the evidence is building that we have reason to trust God. God makes a prophecy, and then we see 150 years later, those things are actually coming to pass. So far, we've been in Syria, and we've been in Tyre and Sidon on the coast. Now the geography is going to move to the south of the promised land. We're going to be looking at the land of the Philistines. And we read in verses 5 and 6, you'll see the names of several cities that were prominent cities as you read the story of Israel in the time of David. These are cities that are well known to be cities inhabited by the Philistines. Listen to God's judgment against them, starting in verse 5. Ashkelon will see it, and they will be afraid. Gaza, too, will writhe in great pain. Also Ekron, for her hope, has been put to shame. Moreover, the king will perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon will not be inhabited. And those of illegitimate birth will inhabit Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. This is God's prophecy of judgment against the Philistines. God is really clear about this. Ashkelon is afraid. They're afraid because they have no resources like the resources of Tyre and Sidon. And those cities were no problem for Alexander. Gaza is writhing in pain because they know that they're next. They see this army coming and they know they're next. And Ekron is, they've had their hope put to shame. And their hope has been put to shame for a reason. And the reason why is because they had actually made a pact of protection with Tyre and Sidon. And Tyre and Sidon had been destroyed and annihilated by Alexander, so all of their hope is gone. And then God also mentions that Ashdod will have illegitimate birth. What happened when they fell was Alexander's soldiers killed all of the men, and then they raped and pillaged the women. And so you had this this half-breed race that was raised up of, of Greeks and Philistines. It's exactly what took place. And then you see, as you read farther in verse 5, moreover, the king will perish from Gaza. This is what Alexander did. He captured the king of Gaza, and he drilled holes in his feet, and he put cords through the feet, the holes in his feet, and he attached those cords to a horse, and he dragged the king through the city until the king was dead. And so what you see here is that everything that God decreed came to pass. This came to pass in 332 BC at the hands of Alexander. So this is what God decreed he would do. And and the big picture here is that God is going to judge the Gentile. And he explained how he would do it, and he would use, again, a Gentile instrument 
to do that, a pagan instrument. But in his mercy, God decreed that not only would he judge the Gentile, but he would bring salvation to them. That's our next point, and we're going to see that in verse 7, a salvation to the Gentiles. So God is prophesying here about the people of Philistia. And again, this is in a region to the south of the promised land. And what had happened was Alexander had moved through from the north through the south, and he had destroyed them. But God says in verse 7, I will remove their blood from their mouth and the detestable things from between their teeth. The Philistines had many practices that were offensive to God. And one of those practices that was most offensive to him was the way that they ate their food. The way they ate their food was with blood in it. They consumed the blood along with the meat. When you read your Old Testament, God had said Israel was not to do that. And also they paraded their idolatry for everybody to see. They had their idols, they had their things that they worshipped, and it was very, very visible. And that was very offensive to God. And you would think that this would permanently dispose God against these people. It would raise God's wrath and ire so that he would just destroy them permanently. But here we see that God actually wants to save them. And you see that at the end of the verse, at the end of verse 7. They will be a remnant for our God and be like a clan in Judah, an Ekron like a Jebusite. So God's promise to Israel was that he would preserve a remnant of Jews. And God did preserve a remnant of Jews. And he will preserve a remnant of Jews. And those Jews will be ready and they will be there for Christ when he returns. But along with that, the Philistines will be included in that remnant. This is really astounding. They'll be like a clan. Almost all of them were wiped out by Alexander. But a small number remained. And those ones would be recipients of God's grace. And so all of this was accomplished in the intertestamental period between the time of the return from exile in Babylon until the time of the earthly ministry in Christ. What we see here is that Alexander was brutal and he conquered the Gentile nations that were surrounding Israel, but God mercifully extends his saving hand to some of them. So verse eight degrees about how Alexander will treat Israel Verse 9 decrees about how God will save and protect them. And again, he's doing this through a pagan instrument. And next what we see in verse 8 is his mercy to the Jews. And the context here, as we consider God's mercy to the Jews, is Alexander had moved on from the south in Philistia. He moved on further west into Egypt. And what he did out there was he established himself as Pharaoh. He was given the title Pharaoh, and he established a city, Alexandria, he was so proud of himself and so full of his own self-esteem that he named it after himself. It became a very big, very flourishing, very intelligent, academically accredited city. So he did that, but after he did that, he doubled back and he headed eastward, and he was going to head through the Promised Land on his way to take Pakistan and India. And his objective was to conquer the whole world. But we'll see here is God's plan to protect the Jew. And we see that in verse 8. God says, I will camp around my house because of an army, because of him who passes by and returns. And no taskmaster will pass over them anymore, for now I have seen with my eyes. God says, I will camp around my house. God is speaking of his own temple, the temple that Zerubbabel and friends finished right after the return from exile. God is saying this, and he's using language of a military protector in the Hebrew here. God is saying, I am going to be your military protector. And he tells us that he will do this because of an army. That's Alexander's army that has passed through on its way to Egypt, and it's coming back when he returns. So he passes by on his way to Egypt, and then he returns, and he's passing through the promised land, and he's on his way to India and Pakistan. What we have here is a remarkable story of how it is that God actually chose to spare and be merciful to his own people when Alexander, who had just destroyed everything in his wake, came to the promised land. What happened and what history says is the high priest showed Alexander prophecies about Alexander himself that were written 200 years earlier in the book of Daniel, and they're in Daniel chapter 8. I want to read Daniel chapter 8, verse 7, and then I want to read verse 21. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn there? And we will see the things that, that are described here by Daniel. And there are things that Alexander himself actually did. It's describing Alexander himself and his activities. 
Daniel 8, verse 7. And it's speaking of the shaggy goat. And we're going to see the identification of the shaggy goat when we drop down to verse 21. Daniel writes, I saw it, again, that's the goat, reach the side of the ram, and it was enraged at it, and it struck the ram, and it broke its two horns in pieces, and the ram had no strength to stand in opposition to it. So it threw it down to the ground and trampled on it, and there was none to deliver the ram from its power. That's how Alexander treated the ram. This is a description of Alexander's defeat of Syria. This had taken place three years before um, Alexander came and met the high priest. This is his defeat of Darius III in 333 BC. So Alexander sees this prophecy in the scriptures of exactly what it was that he did in this battle. And he left Jerusalem doing no harm to it or to the people in it. So that's the picture of God controlling human history to the Gentiles, to redeem some of them, to judge those Gentiles and redeem some of them, and then to mercifully save his own people. And again, he did this through a pagan instrument, an arrogant, self-exalting man who had no love for God, no love for God's word, no love for God's people, yet God saw fit to use him. And in verses 9 and 10, we're going to see another man. This man is not a pagan conqueror, but this man is the ultimate conqueror. It's Jesus at his first coming. And he is characterized by humility. So let's take a look at the perfect Emmanuel in verses 9 and 10. And here we're going to get two views of Christ. And the first view is Christ at his earthly appearance. And the second is the one um, he's coming later when he established his millennial kingdom. So first we're going to see the perfect Emmanuel who conquers sin in verse 9. And what we need to remember in this is, is what Alexander would do is he would defeat the people and he would take away their liberty. In contrast, we're going to see Jesus. And what Jesus does is he actually saves his people and he gives them liberty, but he gives them liberty from their sin. So let's see that as we read verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Make a loud shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Israel is to rejoice greatly here. Greatly. Like a woman on her wedding day, there's a joy of this day that you've been anticipating, you've been looking forward to for your whole life, and it comes. That's the joyful rejoicing, greatly. And there's to be a loud shout. It's to be welcoming Christ as he comes as king, because this conqueror is like no other. So we have this picture of this coming conqueror, and we want to say, oh, it's coming, and all of this magnitude, and all of this glory, and all of this victory. But as we keep reading in verse 9, we're going to see what Messiah looks like when he comes first in his first earthly advent. And it's humility. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and he's endowed with salvation. He's lowly. He's mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a pack animal. This passage is quoted directly in two places in our New Testament in the Gospels. It's quoted once in Matthew 21. And then again in John 12, foreign rulers have come and gone through Israel, and Alexander was one of them. And what God is telling Israel here is he is your king. You notice that? He is your king. He comes from your people, and he is righteous, which means that he possesses everything you need to have a right standing with the God who will redeem you. And everything that he does is right because he's righteous. And he is endowed with salvation. And that's what he gives you when you embrace him as your Lord and your Savior. He is nothing like the pagan instrument. And he's coming to you. You don't have to find him. He is coming to you. And he is going to assert his dominion to claim his throne. He is coming to you. There are two verses in Matthew 21 that describe how this is. And it comes out. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. Go procure this foal for me, and I'm going to ride into town. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their garments on them, and Jesus sat on the garments. At this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, he fulfills right here, right at that time, right at that location, Zechariah's prophecy. We have it fulfilled, and that is another reason that we can trust God, and he will be faithful. But we want to make sure that we don't miss the main point of this verse. 
It's a verse that's really familiar to us. But we notice that Jesus is mounted on a donkey. We know this. A donkey is a beast of burden. And as the Savior, Jesus will be burdened with the sin of those he saves. That's why he's riding on a donkey. He's lowly and he's mounted on a donkey. He's not riding on the donkey because he's humble. Yes, he is humble, but that's not the reason he's riding on the donkey. He's riding on the donkey because he wants to demonstrate that he will save people by bearing the burden of their sin. So in the same way that donkeys bear burdens, Jesus bears the burden of sin for every single one of those that he saves. In his first advent, in his earthly ministry, he did not come to conquer. So he wasn't riding on this big, great white steed. He was riding on a donkey because he came to bear the burdens of those that he would save. So he'll conquer sin at the cross, but he is also the perfect Emmanuel who will conquer the world. And we see that in verse 10. And here's where God moves forward in time. And verses 9 and 10 are both future from Zechariah's point of reference. He's going to be talking about Jesus' millennial reign. But both the millennial reign and the earthly reign of Jesus, the earthly ministry of Jesus, were future to Zechariah. And he really couldn't distinguish one from the other. He had no idea that there would be a New Testament canon. He had no idea that Pentecost would come. He would have no idea that there was this thing that would form called the church. And the church would be populated primarily by Gentiles. And that that church that's populated by Gentiles would be the means that God's message was taken to the ends of the earth. He had no idea of all of those things. He had no idea of the time frame of them either. He knew exactly what it was, but he just didn't know when it was. 1 Peter 1.11 tells us this. It tells us that the prophets were inquiring to know what time or what kind of time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he was predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The sufferings of Christ is his earthly ministry when he came to save. The glories of Christ is millennial reign when he came to rule and reign on this earth. The prophets had no idea exactly when those things would take place and when they would play out. They really didn't have any idea of what that looked like in the timeline of human history. To Zechariah, all of it was future. But verse 10 is really speaking of Christ's millennial return. And notice the change in the pronouns from I to he as we see this. God says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horses from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off. And again, this is a generation that was past the generation that was rebuilding the temple. So they're hearing this for the first time and it's very, very encouraging to them. The father says, I'm going to completely remove any means of war in that millennial kingdom from Ephraim, which is in the north, to Judah, which is in the south. So nowhere in the land where there will be any implements of war. But notice then the future, uh, the focus moves to Jesus with a pronoun shift to he. He will speak peace to the nations and his reign will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus is a conqueror and he could destroy them, but he draws them to himself because he is the king of peace. You see, from sea to sea, the idea there is that there's a global reach to his rule. There's a global reach to his reign. There's a global reach to all of those he will save. You see the the mention, the reference to the river that is there? That is the Euphrates River. And that was the boundary that God gave on the east to the land of Canaan that God promised to Abraham. But it's beyond that. It's to the ends of the earth. And what that helps the Jew understand that it's not just the land that, that of Israel that Jesus will rule over, but he will rule over everything. So God is telling Israel here in verse 10, you are familiar with a Messiah that will rule over your land and he will. He will be positioned there. He will rule from there. But your Messiah will rule not only there, but beyond there. And will rule beyond your land to the, over the whole earth. So the summary here for us is that Messiah initially comes and he is clothed in humility because of the burden that he is going to bear of everybody's sin. But he ends in permanent global dominion. And that is something that a pagan instrument could never do. Alexander or any other military leader in human history could never do what Christ is doing and what Christ will do. And the reason for that is because Messiah Jesus really is a better conqueror than any other conqueror in the history of this world. So we have God's purposes accomplished through a pagan instrument, 
And Israel's Messiah is a more perfect Emmanuel for them. And these Jews, again, they lived 40 years after the temple was built. And they're going to be asking a question when they hear about all of this. Got these prophecies that are coming in the future. And they didn't know either about whether there was a distinction between the the earthly ministry of Jesus and the millennial reign. But to them, they were all in the future. And to them, they could be thinking, well, what about us? What does that mean for us today? And what we see in verses 11 through 17 is that God is committed not only to the past or in the future, but he is committed to the present. And God makes clear to this Judah, the Judah that's right in front of him that are listening to Zechariah, that they are going to be included in his plan. So what we're going to see in verses 11 through 17 is a present inclusion. Inclusion of Judah in God's plan really has three parts. parts, And the first of it is God's covenant to them. And you see that in verse 11. God says, as for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. So there he says, as for you also, he's speaking right to this generation, these people. You've heard of my plans for the the pagan instrument. You've heard of my my design for the perfect Emmanuel. But here, I am speaking about you. And it's rooted in my covenant to you. And it's because of the blood of the covenant. God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. That I'm going to give you land. I'm going to make you a great nation. And you are going to be a blessing to all of the people. What is important for us in all of that is it is ratified with blood. And what that means is that it cannot be violated And it absolutely will be guaranteed to occur. And so God is telling these people in this generation, for you, my promises will be met. You see here that God says, set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. He speaks of a waterless pit. And and all good Jews knew what would come to mind when he would be speaking of a waterless pit. Two primary examples come to mind. Joseph was thrown into a waterless pit and Genesis chapter 37 by his brothers, and he was sold off into slavery, into Egypt. But then in Jeremiah 38, Jeremiah was also lowered into a cistern where he would die, or they intended for him to die, but he was rescued. And God is telling Israel, the future of your situation will be hopeless, humanly speaking. Your situation will have no hope at a human level. But I will rescue you in the future, just as I rescued Joseph and Jeremiah in the past. And he wants him to understand exactly how certain this is. And it's very important that we see the tense of the verb that's used here. God says, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. He uses past tense to explain a future event. And the reason why he does that is he wants them to understand that this is as certain as if it has already happened and occurred. And so God is saying, my, universal, my unilateral covenant with you is what motivates me to be faithful to my promise to you. I will save you. It's as good as done. And those promises are detailed in verses 12 and 13. We see those, God's promises. And this is surprising to the people because of what he says, they will be in his hand as an instrument against those who oppress them. And at this time, there were some Jews who were still dispersed. This is 40 years after the first return There were tons and tons of Jews still dispersed. Most of them were in Babylon. He says, return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have hope. This very day, I am declaring that I will return double to you. So he says, return to the stronghold. He's saying, go back to Jerusalem. Go to Judah. Go to the promised land. Get out of where you were in exile and come back. And the reason why you're to do that is because you are prisoners, but you have the hope. You have confidence in a certain future event. And that event is my covenant with you. And my promise to you is that when you return, I will return double to you. I will return double to you. And the idea here is grace, enabling grace that God will extend towards that generation of Jews. Abundant grace. And verse 13 tells us exactly what that grace looks like. And as we think about this, what we need to understand in the intertestamental period is that the Jews were subjected to the Greeks. After Alexander came along and was kind to them and merciful and moved through the promised land, leaving them pretty much untouched on his way to India and Pakistan, Alexander died a young man and those that came after him weren't, they weren't nearly as kind to Israel. They were very, very harsh on them. God is promising them, I will make you like a mighty man's sword. Let's read verse 13 together and actually see what he says. 
He says, I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow of Ephraim, with Ephraim, and I will rouse up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and I will make you like a mighty man's sword. So here we have God using Israel as an implement against Greece in the intertestamental period. God's promise is he's going to make them like a mighty man's sword. In other words, God is going to give them power. Judah of Zechariah's time was to know that you will struggle against Greece and they will oppress you, but I will give you the power that you need to subdue them. And this was almost unthinkable because Israel was familiar with God re rescuing them. They weren't familiar with God giving them power in that rescue. And this is God's promise. And this was actually fulfilled a couple hundred years later during the time of the Maccabean re revolt. What had happened was in 175 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes of Greece came to power and he persecuted the Jews and he persecuted them badly. He curtailed all of their religious practices and he made them worship the Greek god Zeus. And so what happened in, in the promised land was that a group of people arose, the Maccabeans, and they were basically guerrillas and there was guerrilla warfare against the Greeks. And God made them very effective in that. They killed many Greeks and they ended the persecution of the Greeks over them. And Jews throughout history have celebrated that event with Hanukkah. That's the basis for the Jewish holiday, Hanukkah. And so there again, God is saying, Judah and Ephraim, you were like arrows in my quiver, and I will bring an end to the oppression of the Greeks against you. So God's promise to Israel for the intertestamental period was that Israel themselves would exact that vengeance on their Greek persecutors. And history shows us that God was faithful to his word then. So we have every reason to believe that God will be faithful to every promise that he has made that has not yet been fulfilled. So next, God advances ahead to the millennial uh, time frame where the focus is on his power in verses 14 through 17. God is explaining the details of his power. God says, Then Yahweh will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, and the Lord Yahweh will blow the trumpet and will go in the storm winds of the south. So then there is our key that we have a transition in time from the intertestamental period to some time that's in the future. And again, Zechariah didn't know where that was. But in verse 13, God gave power to Judah. In verse 14, Yahweh himself in the millennial kingdom will reign over them. In verse 13, Ephraim was like an arrow as God was deploying them against the Greeks. In verse 14, when describing the millennial kingdom, Yahweh's arrow is the one that goes forth. And God himself is actually doing the work. And the Lord Yahweh will blow the trumpet. Now the one blowing the trumpet is the one who normally leads the charge. He's the one who is going forth first. Jesus himself will lead the charge against all of those that have arrayed themselves against the Jews. Right at the end of the, this age, at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. And lastly, we read that the Lord Yahweh will go in the storm winds of the south. We know what storm winds are like. We know what the monsoon season is like here. And we know what those haboobs are like, that wall of sand that just moves across. You've seen video clips of it, or you've seen it on the news, or you've seen it in real life. It's just this wall of sand that moves forward, and it takes out everything in its path. It's very, very destructive. Nothing can stand against it. And this is a picture of Jesus at the final battle. He is the one who will charge, and he is the one who will consume, and he is the one who will be unstoppable. And this is really, really encouraging to the Jew. And especially when we read, we see that Jesus not only is the attacker, but he's also the defender. He's doing both things at the same time. And we see that in verse 15. Yahweh of hosts will defend them, and they will consume and trample on the stones of a sling, and they will drink and roar with wine. And they will be filled like a sacrificial bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. This is really, really helpful. The Jews understood this language. So it's good for us to walk through this and get a, a good, clear picture of what's taking place. God says, they will consume and trample on the stones of a sling. He's speaking of the Jewish people who are going to be participating along with Christ as Christ establishes millennial reign by defeating those who are arrayed against him. And many nations used slingshots in times of war in that era. They were familiar with it. They knew the story of David and Goliath. It was a very, very effective weapon. 
the enemy, what God is saying here is that they will hurl stones at you, but those stones will have no effect and you will just trample on those stones. That's the first thing he says. Then he says, they will drink and roar as with wine. What is taking place here is the Jews are participating in a massive, massive celebration, a celebration that is commensurate with the massive scope of their victory over all of those who array themselves against them. And we understand how deep and how permanent and how widespread this will be when we read that they will be like a sacrificial bowl, like the corners of the altar. The Jew will be so victorious in battle that the blood that spatters on their garments, will be, they will be covered in blood to the same degree that the altar is covered in blood during the time of the sacrifice. The altar is covered on all corners with blood during the time of sacrifice. And the Jews' garments will be like that, not with their own blood, but with the blood of those that they defeat. And in verse 16, God says to address his power more completely and more finally, he says, Yahweh, their God, will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they are the stones of a crown sparkling in his hand. Yahweh, their God, will save them. God is not random and he is not capricious in his plan for Jesus coming at the end of this age, at the end of the tribulation, when he establishes his millennial kingdom. He's not capricious in that, and he has a perfect purpose in this. And that purpose is to save his people. And the question we ask is, well, why would it be just to save his people? And we see why in that very same verse, that these people are stones of a crown. What that tells Israel is something that's very, very precious to them. That is that all of the other nations in human history have mistreated Israel. It's continuing today. It happened 50 years ago. It was happening 500 years ago. It happened 1,500 years ago. All of them mistreated the Jewish people. But Christ himself will care for the Jewish people. And he'll care for them because they are a treasure to him. They are precious in his sight. And the last verse in this chapter helps us understand what the blessing will be to these people that Christ protects, that Christ saves. And again, these people are hearing this for the first time because it was the last generation that got all of the visions. Here, Zechariah is speaking directly to them. And he says, what goodness and what beauty will be theirs. Grain will make the choice men flourish and new wine the virgins. So God speaks of goodness. And what he's speaking of there is material prosperity that will be widespread in the land of Israel during the millennial kingdom. You know how it is when you drive through a neighborhood, a wealthy neighborhood, you find yourself somehow you made a wrong turn and you're in this neighborhood and you realize, man, these people, it's really going well for these people. Everything is working well for these people. Um, what God is saying here is it will be abundantly evident that he is providing for these people, that he has blessed them. And it will be abundantly evident in their material possessions, but it will also be evident in their beauty. And this isn't a reference just to women alone. God is speaking to men and women together. He's speaking of the physical beauty of these people, but he's also speaking to a dignity that they carry about themselves because they are God's people in the promised land. They will be distinct from everybody else in those ways. Their land will be flourishing and they will be people. And more about the flourishing land, Land, you read about the grain and the new wine. It's going to be a fertile, abundant land. No more dryness, no more aridness, no more dryness near the Dead Sea. It's going to be ver verdant and fertile and abundant, and they will be reaping the benefits of all of it. And he speaks of choice men and virgins. And what he's saying there is that Israel will be full of people, both old and young, who are doing something very, very substantial. They're going to be vigorously joyfully, faithfully following their Messiah. That's God's picture for them. That this is what he is going to do. This is how he's going to demonstrate his power to them. He's going to save them, and this is what they have for them. So what we see is that God has a perfect plan. He has a plan that involves a pagan instrument. He has a plan that involves a perfect Emmanuel. And then he is including every single generation of Jews before then, between now and then. But we ask ourselves, what does that mean for us today? What does it mean for us today that God is willing to use and able to use a pagan instrument? We're here in Tempe in 2024. We have to ask ourselves one thing. Do we really see institutions for what they truly are in front of us? When we see institutions around us 
and we're dismayed by what we see, do we see them for what they really are? Do we wonder about what will be the result of the conflict in Israel? What will be the real result of the conflict in Ukraine? Or even closer to home, we have an election year this year, and it's very right to be grieved by a godless man fulfilling the office and operating in the office of the most powerful man in this world. But even closer to home than that, does your employer demand things of you that you can't stand for, you can't get behind? Or does he not notice you Does he not recognize your contributions? Are you not being recognized rightly by your employer? I want to stop and just make sure that we understand that God has given us channels and means to address some of these things. And whatever channels God has given us to address, we can use those. And we want to use those in a way that that puts on display the transforming work of the gospel in our own lives. But our greatest joy, our greatest confidence should be in the fact that we know from God's word that the earth and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. So all things, whether it is an employer, whether it is an authority structure, whether it is any other governmental system, when we look at it, we need to remember that they are simply entities that are in God's hands that he will use to accomplish his purpose. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for your word. We praise you for the rightness and the goodness of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to accomplish everything that you have said you would do. We praise you, Lord, that in all that you have said you would do, you do it by your power and by your will. I pray for us, Lord, that we would be confident in you and your purposes, that today as we live, that we would go forth from here knowing, Lord God, that we can trust you with all that lies ahead because of how you have demonstrated to us in the past that you are faithful. You are the same unchanging God We praise you and worship you in Christ's name. Amen.